While the factory revolutionized textile production, there were still many other kinds of products that could not be produced by machines. Take, for instance, shoes, which were the main uh, product of many cities north of Boston in the early 19th century, cities like Lynn, Massachusetts. Now, shoes are very interesting because they show us the transition from an older producerist economy into one dependent entirely upon wage work. In the early, in the, probably at the turn of the century, in the moment when the Republic is being formed, shoes are made in the older form of artisanal organization, with a master on top who owns a house, he owns a workshop, he owns tools, an uh, apprentice who is his second, who lives with him, who works with him, but um, is in training, and then someone right in the middle of them both, someone called a journeyman, who um, is not actually paid for his products, but is sold products by the master, that is, the original leather, the string, everything, the glue you need to make shoes. And so this ordering from apprentices who live with the family but are paid nothing to journeymen who are working with the master, not for the master, and then the masters themselves. It harkens back to the oldest model of production, oikonomia, from the Greek meaning household production, is actually the origin of our word economy. This model breaks down during the same time period as the rise of the factory. This household model with the master as not just employer in the way we would think of it today, but also father, as patriarch, as the overseer of not just the production process, but all the social relationships in that household. So in the household of a master shoemaker, the wife, the daughters, the sons, everyone would be part of the production process. Home and work were not separate. So as we transition from that world into the world of wage work, into the world of the industrious and then the industrial revolution, we begin to understand how this older model of work breaks down in the face of growing markets, mechanization, and of course, capitalism and capitalist investment. This begins to change in the 1830s, this world, as there is an increasing demand for shoes, Local business owners and shopkeepers, the people who the masters originally would sell their shoes for, begin to demand more and more shoes. Masters at first, owning their own capital, owning their own tools, would dictate the prices and the pace of production. But these new shoe merchants needed vastly more quantities of shoes. And so they begin to contract with masters who would produce not for many buyers, but only for that one merchant himself. The demand for the, the size of the orders of shoes brought the putting out system to the shoe industry just as it had to the textiles in the century before. Though the skill of cutting leather into the most efficient shapes remained with the masters, the actual sewing of the shoes, previously done by apprentices and journeymen, was now sent out into the countryside to the local fishing communities of Massachusetts, places where women sitting idly in the winter could sew the shoes together. But still, over the decades, eventually even this system ran out of capacity. And the local merchants realized that instead of sending all those shoes out, they could bring all the people in. And new kinds of manufacturing or spaces began to emerge for the shoe industry. The industrious revolution, the reorganization of people, had occurred in shoes decades later than in textiles, but in exactly the same fashion, with small groups of people, in this case the shoe merchants of Lynn and other places, being able to advance the capital to make these kinds of investments possible, both in the current inventories and in the spaces themselves. Again, this process of moving to the factory whether it's a mechanized factory like in Lowell or just an industrious factory like in Lynn, was about the separation of home and work, about the movement from independent producers to wage workers.